Thanks, Lauren. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for coming to this webinar. Um, we know that for uh, actually, Lauren, can you just move it on one for me? Thank you. Thank you. This is the hopefully you're all in the right place um, for the Birmingham City Council Public Health webinar for around the um, wellbeing measurement toolkit. Um, so we know for any service or intervention, uh, intervention measuring impact and outcomes is key. Um, it helps to show that um, what we are doing is, make, is making a difference and enables us to demonstrate to ourselves and our funders that the difference we are making is measurable. Using standardised measurement tools allows us to compare the impact of our interventions over time. Along with a demographic questions about population identity, such as age, sex, ethnicity, it enables us to see if our interventions are more effective with particular groups or communities. It also allows us to understand how cost effective it might be. Without measuring, it's difficult to make a case for funding or to justify why our interventions should be scaled up or to continue. Next slide, please, Lauren. So our Birmingham Public Health Measurement Toolbox has been developed to provide some standardisation to impact and outcome measures for health and wellbeing interventions across the city. The toolbox can help you early in your planning stage and it can help you to consider the most appropriate outcome measures. It can provide clarity and consistency on how to assess and measure your interventions and then this can be included as evidence when applying for funding. Next slide, please. The toolbox that has been developed can support measurement of different health and wellbeing interventions. And you can see those on the slide there. So things like physical activity, smoking, high blood pressure, and today's um, discussion on mental wellbeing. Each toolkit, including today's, includes links to relevant local or national information, a description of the tool and any thinking or ethical approvals you may need to use it. If any registration is required to use the tool, any guidance to support behaviour change or evidence based interventions, and it includes a case study of how the tool may be used in practice. Next one, please, Long. So when it comes to using the measurement tool, um, it is important that the wording shouldn't be changed or modified in any way. However, However how you how present you the questions, tailoring them to the setting you are working in is important. So for example, if you work face to face, where you have a trained member of staff asking the questions and recording the responses. This approach might work well with people who need additional support due to language or if they have poor digital access. But you have to ensure confidentiality in order to have that conversation. So you can make sure that nobody can overhear that conversation or make notes um, other than what you're taking. You'll also be um, have to input the responses yourself onto the system that's recording your answers. So it's almost like a double uh, um, a double dose of um, recording and then putting those on onto another system. If you use a self completed questionnaire, either online or on paper, it can be quicker and easier to uh, report the results, but it can be difficult if the person completing it has questions or doesn't have access to a digital device. Next slide, please, Lauren. A template for that to report, um, a, temp a template to report uh, outcomes for all of the measurement tools will be provided with the toolkit. It's just being agreed at the moment, so that will be uploaded at, at another point. It's also important that there is no personal identify, identifying information when you're reporting your results to funders. We don't need to see that information. We just need to see some numbers and uptake. It's helpful to collate the results for each group of interest to be clear on intervention demographics. So, for example, it's important um, to kind of split it. So you might have different numbers for different ethnicities or different sexualities. And um, where you only work with small numbers of people, anything five or under should just say that. 
You don't need to put one, two, three or four or five um, people said X. It just helps to in order to just put five uh, or less than five. It helps to maintain some anonymity. OK, with all of that out of the way, um, I'll pass you over to Colin Palmer and Paul Patterson to take you through the mental well-being toolkit. Thank you. Great stuff. Uh, OK, thank you, Lauren. Um, so I suppose we better start off with um, uh, identifying what mental well-being is. So we used to have the concept of mental health that it was purely looked at uh, as in a negative sense. Um, uh, we'd often talk about mental health being synonymous with mental ill health. And what mental well-being is, it's the other component that we now understand that goes under mental health. Um, now, what mental well-being is actually composed of, uh, there's some debate over it, but most researchers would say that um, it involves how we feel, which is called hedonic well-being, and how we function, which is eudaimonic well-being. And if we look at what I've put here as the axis on, on the screen here, and if we think about what I've just said about mental health and mental well-being and mental illness, this makes a lot of sense. We can think that we can actually have a diagnosis of a mental illness, for example, but we can actually be functioning and feeling quite well at that time. And likewise, we might not have a diagnosis of a mental illness, for example, uh, and we can not be functioning or feeling um, particularly well at that, that particular time. So this is a really useful um, extension of what we understand in terms of mental health. Um, we know that mental well-being is related to mental illness, um, so it stands to reason that if we're um, struggling with our mental well-being, um, how we're feeling and functioning for a long period of time, that can be a risk factor for us to develop uh, more serious mental health disorders or illnesses. Um, so that's where mental well-being becomes really, really useful because it's something that we can look at in terms of our mental health, in terms of it being positive and being strength focused, which means we can look at it in terms of uh, protective factors or preventing um, further disorder. Could I have the next slide, please, Lauren? So putting this in the national and local context, um, UK government has been collecting wellbeing data for, for quite some time now, for about 10 years. Um, but like I say, it's a relatively new science and there's lots of different measures that are used um, to identify um, aspects of feeling and functioning. So I've just pulled out a few um, examples here. So we've got life satisfaction, we've got happiness, um, positive outlook, uh, and relationships. And all this data is actually accessible um, via the ONS dashboard um, for wellbeing um, on the ONS um, government site. Could have the next slide, please, Lauren. So again, drilling down further into this, this national and local context, you can see here we've got a graphic. Um, so again, from the, from the same wellbeing dashboard. So we've been able to create a heat map um, of the UK um, uh, over the last 10 years. Um, so that would give us an idea of what's going on um, at a national level. But we can also drill down into Birmingham as well. And it highlights wellbeing is a really useful, well, all, measuring anything is really useful as long as we're consistent with our measurements, because we can see if there are changes uh, that are occurring. And we've just had um, a, a natural intervention that's taken place for all of us, which is COVID. And you can actually see here, if we look at the, um, the Birmingham region, you can see that uh, life satisfaction uh, dipped quite dramatically. Um, during the COVID years, and we're now on the way up as well. We're going back up to, to where we were before uh, COVID took place. So we can see that that natural intervention has taken place, and if we didn't have that measurement, we wouldn't be able to see the difference pre and post COVID. Um, wellbeing is about environments generally. So if we're in a healthy environment, we create a healthy environment, and healthy environments are, are, can be seen as synonymous with interventions, um, then um, uh, that's what well-being will be represented in. Um, so it's really, really useful um, for measuring interventions where we're looking at things on an organisational, regional, uh, community level. Lauren, could I have the next slide, please? So why do we want to me measure mental well-being? Well, from the individual um, uh, perspective, um, we want to have an ev evidence-based approach to understanding how individuals um, and groups feel and function. And if we collect this data, then we're better placed to evaluate the impact of interventions um, and, and it will help us to understand more about our community's well-being. Uh, this then leads into aspects of service improvement. So what can we do with that data? Um, so if we measure it alongside demographic data, we can help to identify if there's any health disparities or inequalities amongst uh, different groups. Then we can use that data to then um, uh, shape uh, interventions and then we can monitor the quality and effectiveness of those interventions or services 
um, to try and identify if there's still any gaps or areas of improvement. Um, and, and, and in a sense, then we can use this data to design and implement policies um, and programmes that promote health equity and social justice. But I'd just say to under, underwrite that, if we're not measuring something, we don't really know what's going on there. So if we are concerned that there might be inequalities or disparities between groups, we need to first measure what, what's going on there to identify those disparities, then try and do something about it, and then measure again to see that we've done a, a, a good job. Could I have the next slide, please, Lauren? Okay, so this brings us to the actual tool that's been recommended in this toolkit. Uh, so this is the Warwick and Edinburgh Mental Wellbeing Scale. And I would say that this is um, one of the gold standard measures for mental wellbeing. Um, it's a really simple scale. Um, it uses 14 items where the participant is asked um, to think about those 14 items over the previous two weeks and then to rate how much that applied to them. Um, and it, the scale goes from none of the time to all of the time. And a really useful thing about the WEMWEBS is it combines um, what we were talking about here in terms of our feeling and functioning into a single score. So it does that, it does that work for you. It's a really good generalised uh, measure of mental well-being. Um, it's really well validated. It's been used by loads of studies internationally and it tests what it says it tests. And it's also reliable as well. So it's been tested over time, but it's still finding what, it, what it's meant to be um, looking for. Um, so it's a really useful full scale in, in that sense. Could I have the next slide, please? Um, yeah, as I said, it's 14 statements. Um, and, it, and another great thing about uh, the web is it's really simple to use as well. So it's really just as simple as adding up uh, the scores for each of the columns uh, and then adding them all together. And that will give you the score um, overall for that individual. And then what you can do is we can look at um, average scores that might be in groups. So if we're collecting demographic data alongside this data, then for example, we could have um, a, a group of people that were a young demographic and a group of the older demographic. We can separate their scores into those two groups. Then we'll have an average for young and old. And that can be really useful if we're looking at interventions then, because we might find that an intervention that we're doing is quite suitable for the older group, but not suitable for the younger group. And that can help us to make amends there and try and change things around. Could I have the next slide, please, Lauren? And this is just a graphical representation of what we're, we're, we've been trying to um, get across here, of why measurement is so important, important and how it can be instructive to, to what we're trying to do if we're trying to intervene. Um, if we think that our T1 is our baseline, so that's T1 is just time one. And so we, uh, the first instance, when we um, are uh, exposed to, to a population of participant group, we want to know what's going on at that, that, that stage. So we do our, our baseline measurement then. Um, so we've got a, a baseline that we can compare things to. Then we have our intervention or, or the event in the, in the case of COVID I've explained. And then what we want is a follow-up measure that's consistent with our, with our initial measure um, so that we can evaluate any changes that have, have taken place. And that can be really useful. So going back to the example of um, uh, the young group and the old, older group, um, we, if we just had one, one time point and, and there's this difference, we, we might not know what, what the difference was between those groups. But if we can see that actually the younger uh, um, a participant group had changed uh, quite significantly and the, and the older one hadn't, then we can see that difference. But we need those two time points to be able to make that, um, make that judgment. So that's just a very simple way of, of how this can be useful. Could I have the next slide, please, Lauren? Okay, so where can you get the, the, the measurement tool? Um, so it's available um, from the um, University of Warwick Medical School. It's free to use for non-commercial use. Um, I've put the link here. You just have to um, uh, click onto the, to the website and then you can register um, to use the, 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 the schedule and they'll send you um, a folder or a link to, I think it's a shared online folder where you can get hold of the, the measurement. Um, but you do need to register um, uh, just to say that you want to use it. Could I have the next slide, please? So what are some of the specific risks to consider? Um, so first and foremost, access. So can, as Joe alluded to in the introduction, can the participants that you want to sit this measure, can they access it? So think about, yeah, whether they could access to a computer, think about the language that they might speak, um, think about whether um, they need it to be a sign language or whether participants might be visually impaired. Um, really great thing about when we're, because it's been uh, used so commonly, um, you can get lots of different versions of it. There's even a signed language version um, on the on the um, 
the work medical school website as well um, so it all makes sense once you go onto that website there's there's lots of information of the different versions um, it's also to be mindful about you know, what we're using mental well-being for we said that it is related to, to, to mental health but there is no diagnosis of low uh, well-being so just be sensitive around um, your findings explaining um, what, what the limitations of mental well-being for example it's not here to give you a diagnosis of, uh, of, of your mental health it's a it's a positive strength strength focused um, approach to mental health um, and also just being mindful then that obviously mental um, well-being might be a sensitive issue for some individuals they might be struggling um, with their feeling and functioning at that time um, so it's always a good idea to inform participants prior to the measurement what they're doing why they're doing it and then to do a debrief afterwards um, which would be some signposting just some support in case anyone needed it could i have the next slide please And yes, yeah, some just some 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 basic research um, considerations um, that anyone that's doing any measurement should consider. Um, so with ethics, we always are looking to protect our participants. Um, one of the simple things we can do here is that we can always allow them to withdraw and let them know that taking part in this measurement isn't going to, or if they choose to not take part in, it, in this measurement, if they do take part in this measurement, and they get a certain score. This is not going to have any detrimental impact on the services that they um, receive. Um, we also need to ensure that people are happy to, to take part. It's about consent. Um, consent is about um, individuals understanding what their data is being used for and um, agreeing to it being used for those purposes. Um, and then also, uh, as Joe alluded to, it's about confidentiality as well. Keeping participants' data safe, especially if it's sensitive data. Um, Think about if you if you are uh, using uh, participant names, then uh, something that you can do is you can translate them into code so that they're not identified in case anyone um, hacked into your computer system or broke into a filing cabinet. Um, so what you might want to do then is, is, is code, have a key that unlocks that, that data, and you'd want to store that somewhere separate from where you're storing the rest of the data. And you can either do that via encryption if you're doing things digitally, or you can do that um, by having um, storing in a separate storage cabinet, for example, with a lock. Just taking that extra step of care to make sure that people's data is protected. And I've just put some links here that's some more information um, about things like GDPR, um, and um, we've got some, um, me and Paul run a, a separate website which talks about some of this stuff from a teacher's perspective, but the information is just the same. So I've put another link there if you want to click on that and I'll give you some ideas. Could I have the next slide, please? Oh, sorry, this is a, towards the end now. This is just some additional resources. So I've, I've put some links here to the um, uh, the ONS site with the wellbeing dashboard. You might want to have a look on there just to place whatever you're going to be doing in um, data for, for, for the Birmingham region and the national picture. Um, I've also got the, um, the link to uh, the WebWEMS page. Uh, and there's also a couple of reports here, uh, recent reports on um, mental health and wellbeing uh, for both adults and, and children. So that might be of use to you in your practice. Could I have the, yeah. Okay, so um, I'm just gonna talk you through a case study here, which is just a, a practical application of everything we've just gone through then. Uh, so, and this is a real, real case study that, um, that took place this year. So, uh, Birmingham City Council has been collaborating with the University of Warwick um, and have been doing some work using the WebWEMS in schools, um, getting schools to do wellbeing assessments, essentially. Um, so, back in 2022, um, schools were assessing their wellbeing to, to get this baseline at time one of the wellbeing of their schools. Um, and this involved getting pupils to fill out the WebWEMS, and then this was linked to their student record, which contained selected demographic data so that pupils couldn't be identified, but still some groups could be used to, to, to be analysed. Um, and what they found, uh, well, what one, one school found in particular, was that wellbeing was significantly lower for year nine girls. Um, so what that school actually did then was they carried out some focus groups. They investigated uh, year nine girls to find out what they could do and, and what might be a, a good way to build an intervention and a way forward to try and improve that. And that involved providing some extra support to that year group. Then this year in 2023, the schools uh, reassessed wellbeing again using the WebWEM, so a consistent measure across those two time points. Um, and they found um, that actually the school that had previously highlighted this um, uh, lower wellbeing in year nine had actually improved. Um, and they actually found that for year nine and year 10, which makes sense because actually it was the year year 10 now in 2023 they had actually been able to advise um, um, on how to improve wellbeing as well. And that had a positive impact on them as well. So it just shows 
you how it can be practically applied. It is very simple. Um, you need a decent, validated, reliable measure. You need to use it at two time points um, with that event intervention in the middle to try and find out what those differences are. So I hope that's been useful and I'll pass over now to Wendy. Thank you, Colin. Hello, everyone. So I'm Wendy Robertson. I'm from Thurrock and Brentwood Mind, and we're a voluntary sector mental health charity in Essex. So I come with the experience of being a provider. So to give a little context, we've got services ranging from early intervention through to crisis response, and we work closely in partnership with statutory and other voluntary sector organisations. We've got nearly 100 staff. We support more than 15,000 people a year from the age of 11 up. And we use both the short and long versions of the scale. And as Colin mentioned at the start, middle and end of support. And if possible, after support has ended so that we can see whether that well-being has been sustained. So we've heard how it can be used to identify where support and funding is needed. And as an organisation, we are collating that information for that purpose. But mainly, we use it as a key working tool on an individual basis. So we co-produce our services. And so when we approach the people we support and our staff, and we're choosing the best scale to use, because as I'm sure you're aware, there are many out there, they preferred this scale because of its positive statements and the fact that it could be used easily and it was in simple language that people could understand and it really aligned with how we work in a personalised way. So our counselling service chose to use the longer version with the 14 statements but the majority of our other services use the shorter version which is seven statements but it allows us to compare across the whole organisation because the seven statements are also part of the the 14 scale. So I'd like to introduce you to Jenny. So Jenny, Jenny is a real person. She has given her consent for me to share this information with you and chose the photo that she wanted to use. And this is the way that we have, we present case studies within the organisation because it really just gives you a one page snapshot of where somebody is. So we first met Jenny when she was 17. She was referred to our transitions worker who works alongside CAMS and Jenny had had therapy for PTSD because sadly her brother had died by suicide when when she was 13. So she was she was really struggling. So we have an initial well-being conversation and it's really focused around what matters to you. And at that point is when we do the first web scalp. So Jenny's initial score was 10. What she said to us is because she'd been coping with the death of her brother, she really hadn't been able to concentrate at school. She'd been absent a lot. Social care were involved. She'd been excluded on several occasions and had in her words, been acting out, her behaviour wasn't good and she'd really been struggling. But having had therapy at CAMS that she'd found really useful and really successful, she decided she really wanted to make a go of her life and she wanted to use her lived experience around mental health to be able to support other people. So again, in Jenny's words, she felt she had no prospects, no hope, no qualifications because she'd not been able to apply herself to her GCSEs, although she was bright, she felt she'd not reached her potential and she had no idea where to start. And she was adamant that she wanted a career and not just a job. And so she she did have the option to go into retail in Thurrock. We've got quite a few shops at that offer employment to younger people, but she, she really wanted to train and to work within the mental health field. So kind of a support, what did we do? So we offer one-to-one -one tailored sessions around what people want to achieve. And for her, it was very much, I need qualifications. I need to be able to write a CV. 
I I need to be taken to places because I don't know what to do or how to get there. And so we accompanied her to our local youth hub that helped her with her CV. We then referred her over to an organisation called TCHC that are employment support for young people aged 16 to 18. And she did a lot of preparation with them. She also said, I've I haven't got anything in common with friends from school. I need a new circle of friends, but I want to meet with people that have got a similar experience and understand what it's like with mental health. And so so we co-produce our services and we managed to get funding for a social group. Uh, They've named it themselves Be Unique. And so she was able to meet with a group of up to There were 12 at the time, young people that had all come through a journey from CAMS and wanted to meet with people socially. And then from that project, again, we got grant funding for a volunteer youth champion programme where young people wanted to train to be volunteers. But they told us that our existing volunteer programme was full of old people who were perhaps 40 plus. So (laughs) again, acting on what they said, we tailor made a a volunteer program around them. And a lot of those sessions were around assertiveness, confidence, how you tell your story and a big focus on social action. So you can see that Jenny kind of progressed from being a service user quite rapidly into becoming a volunteer. So at the point she stopped being a service user, her score was around 21, so mainly threes, where previously it had been ones and twos on the scale. She's very proud of her qualifications, so level twos in English and maths functional skills, which then opened the door for her to do a level one health and social care, and the level one employability qualification came along her employment preparation that she'd done. So she was a volunteer youth champion involved in social action, going out to local schools and colleges and speaking about her experience and has really been really involved in setting up our other projects, like our 18 to 25 project and making sure our language is appropriate for the age group of people that we're trying to encourage for support. She got a kickstart apprenticeship for six months, which was a paid position. And I think this is where we were really fortunate in our local area in Thurrock, as Jane will know, because Jane was in Thurrock previously. And our commissioners really supported putting people with lived experience into paid positions in services. And so a position was created, a trainee peer worker position that Jenny was successful when she applied for. Um, She had IMROC peer training funded by HEE and is now in a peer worker role with our 18 to 25 project. So a real success story of someone that's come through services and has then gone on and is giving back and achieving what she wanted to achieve. I'm not suggesting we can create a position for everybody. There are many other success stories like Jenny's, but um, she actually did her swim webs again yesterday and scored 31. And she was so proud to be able to have mapped her, her progress. But again, really looking at she's had challenges along the way. Her mum died recently. And as a young person, that was really, really difficult for her to cope with. And I'm sure if we'd done a swim webs at the time, it would have been much lower. So it's recognising that it's just a snapshot of where somebody is at the time, but can really help focus on how you tailor your support so that they can reach the outcomes that they want to reach. It helps to have that conversation. So I hope that's just a kind of example of the people behind the scores when when you're producing numbers on mass. I think it's always good to to remember that it can be used for individuals as well as collating figures for funders, which is also important. 